Hello and welcome to Football Daily. Today we're looking at the times that football became bigger than a sport and changed the world forever. 5. The South African Mean Machine The prison of Robben Island in South Africa is most famous for housing Nelson Mandela for 18 of his 27 years in prison. Madiba's jail was a brutal place where prisoners worked in lime quarries, their eyes damaged by the glare off the stone, and white guards abused and harassed black inmates. One of the few books in the prison library was the FIFA rulebook, and desperate for some normality, prisoners would ask every single week to be allowed to play football. For years the request was denied and punishment followed, but eventually the guards relented and a league was created, the Makana Football Association. Goals were made with nets that washed up on the shores of the island, and over half the inmates were on one team or another, with their rivaling political allegiances forgotten during games. The league maintained an archive of the scores and disciplinary records, whilst one of the association's referees, Jacob Zuma, went on to become president of South Africa in 2009. Mandela himself was not permitted to play, but experts have claimed that the Makana FA taught organisational skills to men who would go on to hold offices like Chief Justice and Minister of Sport in the new South Africa after the apartheid. It gave hope to hopeless prisoners, with many earning degrees whilst inside the jail, and in 2007, the Makana FA was recognised for all it had done when it was awarded an honorary FIFA membership. 4. Iraq vs Saudi Arabia The 2007 Asian Cup final didn't seem like a huge event. It finished 1-0 in front of a crowd of just 60,000 people, only about half the capacity of the Jalora Bunkano Stadium in Jakarta where it was held. But the winners were Iraq, and their first international trophy mattered less to them than the emotions their victory over Saudi Arabia had unleashed in their homeland. Ripped apart by years of foreign interference, war and the horrifying rule of Saddam Hussein before that, Iraq finally had something new to celebrate. But the game almost didn't take place at all. After the semi-final against South Korea, suicide bombers targeted groups of fans, killing more than 50 people and injuring over 100 more. The team considered pulling out of the tournament, but Yunus Mahmoud, the captain, saw a woman crying on TV over the body of her 12-year-old son. She called the child a sacrifice for the Iraqi national team and the squad resolved to win for their country. Mahmoud led out a team of Shias, Sunnis and Kurds in the final. Three factions Hussein had pitted against each other during his brutal reign. And when the skipper scored the winner, the Lions of Mesopotamia became a symbol of national unity, as Iraqis of all ethnicities celebrated in the streets of Baghdad. CNN later revealed that ethnic violence halved in the month after the final and the national team was held up as an example of what racial harmony could look like years after the conflict. 3. Germany reunited After the separation of East and West Germany at the end of the Second World War, there were three German national teams, East, West and Saarland. Eventually Saarland was folded into West Germany, who went on to win three World Cups, while East Germany qualified for just one edition of the tournament in 1974, where they beat the West 1-0. Though the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, reunification was not official until 1990, and after East Germany narrowly failed to reach that year's World Cup, millions on both sides of the country cheered on West Germany as they won the trophy. Remarkably, East and West were drawn together in qualifying for Euro 92, but by the time the fixtures were due to be played, the nation had officially been united again. The first game with a combined Germany 11 was a 3-1 win over Sweden, and several players from East became regular members of the squad, including Matthias Sammer, who won the Ballon d'Or six years later. In 1996, Germany won the European Championships, and in 2014, a fourth World Cup, the first ever achieved together. Two. Didier Drogba ends a war. In the early 2000s, the Ivory Coast was dealing with a civil war, with tensions between Muslims and Christians and between Ivorians and immigrants leading to the deaths of hundreds of soldiers and thousands of civilians. Two ceasefires had failed and French soldiers had also become involved, with violence threatening to spiral out of control and destroy the prosperity that the country had built up since its independence from France in the 60s. But Didier Drogba, a national hero thanks to his enormous success in European football, decided to use his popularity to heal the divide. The nation had come together to watch the Elephants qualify for the 2006 World Cup, and Drogba took advantage, kneeling in front of TV cameras in the changing room after the final qualifying match and begging for peace. Both sides agreed to talks, and a year later the president declared war over, with the football team sealing the deal by playing a game in Buarque, the capital of the northern rebel forces instead of the official capital Abidjan. 
the leaders of the rebels and the government met for the first time and Drogba netted in the 90th minute to give the Ivory Coast a 5-0 win over Madagascar. He may have scored a penalty in a Champions League final, but nothing Drogba ever did matched that moment. 1. The Christmas Miracle The First World War was a notoriously bloody and bitter conflict but there was one early ray of light. In December 1914, after seven months of fighting, British, French and German troops were living in trenches just yards from each other. Often they would sing their respective national anthems to taunt each other, but as Christmas approached, both sides began to join in carols. On Christmas Eve, troops ventured cautiously into no man's land and met one another against the commands of their officers. The Germans, always enthusiastic about Christmas, gave the British beer and tobacco, while both sides buried dead friends and swapped news and stories. Someone found a football, and soon hundreds of men who had been trying to kill each other were playing football together. Soldiers later claimed that the Germans won 3-2. Hardly a surprise, really. On Boxing Day, two officers said a final Merry Christmas and fired shots in the air to signal that the war was back on. It had been a special moment, which wasn't repeated during the rest of the war as German and British generals prohibited any more fraternisation. But the game meant something to those involved, as it showed them that they were fighting men just like them, and not a faceless enemy. And 96 years later, in 2008, soldiers from both countries met to play football on what had once been the battlefield. The Germans won 2-1 though. Some things never change. So there we have it, but what do you guys at home think? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, why don't you click here for loads more great content and down there to subscribe. And as always, guys, we'll catch you later.